Um, so, okay, I'm going to talk to you today about, um, you know, primarily my research because that's why I'm here. That's always why we're here, is what we love, is, is, is what gets us up in the morning. Um, and I'll talk about some of the motivation for that, some of the toys I play with, and some of the impact that my research has had. And then I'll switch over and hopefully it'll, it'll all come together at the end. How I got here, what, why I'm doing this, and some thoughts on leadership. So, um, the motivation for my research, and you know, 50 years ago, the type of structures that we're building now, we could only dream about. And I think that, you know, I'm 54, and I think that in the last 50 years, I've seen technology and engineering absolutely, you know, the difference between when I was a child and, and what we can do now it is fantastic. Um, and so, you know, engineers have access to new materials, new design tools, new manufacturing techniques. And we can now build these incredible, beautiful structures that are larger, lighter, and more complex than ever before. So that's the motivation which sort of drives my work. But the justification for the work is, is the reality of that work, is that engineer structures, they break, they fall down, they, they, they get older like we all do. Um, one of the structures I've worked on is Hammersmith Flyover. Um, this was closed in Christmas 2011 and there was absolute chaos, it was just before Christmas and the whole of London and anybody trying to get out of London just ground to a halt. And the fault was quite simple, it was corroded cables. Um, the emergency repairs cost them £10 million, the further work cost them £60 million. And they could have stopped that, they could have saved all that money if they'd actually had some structural health monitoring on that bridge to give them early warning of failure. And that's what my research does, it is structural health monitoring. Um, another justification for this is the absolute huge cost of, of inspections, for instance, on, on engineering um, structures such as aircraft. So the global cost of an inspection of, of an aircraft fleet is around 300 million a year, and the estimated savings using structural health monitoring is around about 30 million a year. Um, at this point, I'd like to draw your attention to two of my favourite parts of aircraft, the place where wings join the fuselage. <laughs> That's one of my favourite places on an aircraft, because it's one of the questions I always ask, you know, why and how? How do they join those? What stops the aeroplane from falling off the wings? Because, you, you know, I, I love mechanics and you've got the, the forces upwards and you've got the forces down and how does that, you know, how does that happen? And incidentally, this is a really dangerous part of the aircraft when we're building composite aircrafts, because joining the composite components is really difficult. So that's the, that's the area that um, engineers are most worried about on. And I don't want to worry you, know, they're not going to fall off, but that's the area that we, we are taking a lot of interest in. And also landing gear. Everybody takes it for granted that when you land, you know, you're down safely, and when you're up in the air, the landing gear track. But actually, those landing gear, they're one of the most important parts of the aircraft, because that whole, everybody in that aircraft, that whole mass landing on just, you know, four pads of rubber, and those structures that support the aircraft in that very difficult manoeuvre, uh, you know, are really, really important. So those are two of the um, areas that I, I work on. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Oh, no, I'm not, actually. Let me show you this. So this is another justification. And when you think about inspecting structures, I don't think any of us realise how difficult it is. And this is just a little film lent to me by, by um, somebody who uh, physically inspects these structures. click here. So this was a great day. This was a good day for the inspection team. They, they managed to get the boat quite close to the, um, the wind turbine um, structure and they, they felt quite safe on this day getting off. Looking at that, I don't think that's particularly safe. They had to, they had to climb onto the um, deck of the boat and they had to get up that ladder you can see there. And that was an easy day for them. But the interesting thing when you go on um, to look at how they inspect these uh, wind turbines, that's a photograph looking upwards. You don't really get the scale of that, what they have to do from this. If you look more closely at that part there, and then look more closely again, that's the abseiler on the edge of that structure, inspecting that structure for damage. And if you have online structural health monitoring, you take away the need for, to pay very expensive abseilers to climb up those structures to inspect them for damage. So that's the motivation to my work. Um, the work that I've done in Cardiff and the, the work that I'm, I'm famous for in the academic world, the thing that I, I publish a lot on, is actually improving the location accuracy of a technique called acoustic emission. Um, now, acoustic emission is, um, the best way to explain it to a lay audience is it's very, very similar to an earthquake. So acoustic emission works on the basis of the propagating crack 
as, as the crack moves or as there's any, any sort of movement in the material, it releases a stress wave. That stress wave travels to the edge of the material. And in acoustic emission, what we do is we use piezoelectric sensors at the surface of the material to detect really, really minute vibrations at the surface. So you can see that's why that's akin to um, earthquake studies. And actually, a lot of my mathematical sort of reasoning is, is drawn from the, the work of um, earthquake um, studies as well. Um, there are various signals that can be... I forgot to bring my pointer. So there's various signals that can be dictated... I'm not going to get around. Oh, I can use my thing. Okay, so these ones here, the signal detection there, they're transit signals. They're like the little earthquakes. And then in the box that says signal processing, this is some of the signal processing we do. So we have a transient wave, which we can look at in the um, frequency domain, the complex frequency domain, and pick out different frequencies of interest. So we do a lot of work um, looking at fast wave transforms. We also do a lot of work looking at the little dots, and if you think of those little dots, the scale there is amplitude against time, and those reach individual earthquakes, and we can look at how the, and I must stop describing those earthquakes, how the stress waves develop with time, how the damage develops with time, and there's lots and lots of different analysis techniques that work on all those different um, aspects of the signal to allow us to get a lot of detailed information about the source. And obviously the complication for us is that the source um, happens a long way away from the sensors and the path of travel of that signal from the source to the sensor is very, very complex. So interpreting the signal and sort of almost re-engineering the path to the source is very, very complex. And that's what I spend quite a lot of time of my research doing. Um, so it's a passive technique. Uh, it doesn't in involve injecting a signal as um, ultrasonics does, so it picks up the signal from the damage itself, which means that you, know, you, you monitor in real time. Um, it's most attractive. Oh, thank you very much. The button in the middle. Thank you. I've got a pointer now. So it's most attractive. <laughs> I've got to watch out now because I'll be pointing at everything. Thank you so much. Um, and its most attractive attribute is its ability to locate. And we use a, a, a method which is stolen from earthquakes. So the earthquake scientists can look at um, the, the, the source from three different places and use triangulation to actually pinpoint the source. And that's all we're doing in, in my location work. So that involves um, assuming that the path is straight between the sensors and the source, and also assuming that the material is, is, um, is uh, homogeneous and uh, you know, it, it doesn't have any discontinuities, it doesn't have any um, uh, differences in thickness. If you have discontinuities, differences in thickness, differences in materials, then you haven't got a constant velocity and you can't use those simple mathematical formula which are used in location. So those are the two, two difficulties. And my work has, has served to um, address those difficulties. So um, at Cardiff, what we, what we did was we invented a technique called Delta T mapping. Um, the mapping technique is down here. We also use statistical analysis. And one of the interesting things that I found is that we, we struggled for oh, probably, I don't know, years, five or six years. Um, one of my problems was that in commercial systems, which I always use because I think it's great to, to buy a... If, if my work is going to be applied in industry, I don't want a system which is very, very complicated. I want a system which can be bought off the shelf and applied. So my work has been characterised by buying off the shelf systems and working with those companies to actually adapt their systems to, to put in different features. And one of the features of, of commercial um, acoustic emission systems is that they, they look at these waves, so this is the transient wave, and they, you set a threshold, so for instance this red line is the threshold at a certain amplitude, and it only says yes you've got a signal when that signal exceeds the threshold. But of course if you do very, very complicated time of arrival um, methods, where you set this, this threshold is really important, so I've set it there, and actually that gives me 25 um, microseconds difference between the time that the system would tell me the signal arrived and the time that you can see by eye the actual signal arrived. But it's very difficult to automate that. It's very difficult to do that without a threshold setting. And then we found this, this technique which had been um, invented years ago by mathematicians called AIC where we could look for the signal diminishing and then look for where it arrives and basically we can pinpoint exactly using the AIC criteria when the signal arrives. So we look at changes in the signal and this monitors the changes in the signal. So um, we improved the, the, the time of arrival 
um, determination. And we also improved, we developed a, a mapping technique where we could if, essentially calibrate any structure to take into account any differences in velocity. So, you know, the path from, say, you have a font here, the, and this is a hole in the structure, or a different thickness or something, the signal, if it passes through a different thickness or if it has to travel around a hole, will take longer. So we map the structure, so we've got, a, a t if you like, a velocity map of the structure. And that was quite a simple idea. And we've developed it into a technique that can do that automatically. Um, and just to illustrate this, um, a very simple test that we did, which actually I did this and I published it, and then I went to China last year, and I was really amazed by, uh, I went into a, a lab in China, and they said, oh, welcome, we, we've replicated your experiment, and we're teaching all of our engineers to replicate this experiment and work on your techniques, and that's quite humbling as a scientist to think that somebody's read your paper and they, they've replicated your, your simple experiment. So this very simple experiment is aluminium, because you can get cracks in aluminium very easily, we knew that the crack was going to happen here. We put it in fatigue, we put some sensors here, that's the actual crack. And we monitored it using um, acoustic emission sensors. The commercial technique, this, this is a coloured up by density map, so this is a map of that um, structure. And these dots are, uh, if you like, the, the earthquakes or the signals that we've detected. Because of the um, lack of location accuracy in a, in a complex structure, the um, commercial algorithm would tell me that the crack was there, um, which is fine for some structures. It's only a, a, a 25 millimeter error, between 15 and 25 millimeters. But our um, mapping algorithm actually pinpoints spot on the um, source of the crack. And that's very important um, in order to be, be accurate with the location and actually find um, very, very fine um, faults in structures. It's also important because with composite structures, as you spoke about, with these aeroplanes which have the, the wings stuck to the fuselage in composite structures, you get a lot of unseen damage. So you get a lot of damage when, for instance, your, your luggage truck drives into the aircraft by mistake and they go, well, whoops, and they look at it and they say, it's fine, you know, we didn't make a dent. Actually, in composite structures, there's huge damage under the surface, which then can lead to delamination. So it's a big problem with impact. And we've um, demonstrated that our technique can do the same for, for composite structures. And this is just a, a quick um, visual. So there's the C-scan of the damage that was um, put into that composite panel. And that's the, um, I've just put a circle around the actual damage. The commercial algorithm located those two squares and the time of arrival, tech, sorry, the time of arrival um, algorithm uh, located those damages being there. My algorithm located it exactly on, on the point of the damage. So very, very highly accurate um, damage detection. And also if we ran the test further, so the unseen damage was then fatigued and the damage progression was able to be observed using my techniques. And we actually got damage from here. We got the delamination growing even as far away as there. Okay, one of the other areas of um, advances that I've been responsible, my lab's been responsible for is source characterization. And um, engineering is never a, a, an individual sport, it's always a team sport, you always work in teams. And this was a great team with researchers from Sheffield University, um, Keith Wood and, and James Hensman, and I understand James Hensman is actually at your university now. Um, I was hoping I might catch up with him when I was here. Um, also National Physical Laboratory, a company who I've worked with for a long time called Maestros Group. Um, they make acoustic emission um, detection systems, but I work very closely with them to, um, to, to improve their systems, to suggest systems, to suggest improvements to the system that their engineers might like to incorporate in their systems to help other people um, who, who come along and buy their systems detect things better. And it's an interesting thing, you know, I've got off the, the subject a bit, but um, those of you who work in research, um, I don't know whether you ever come across problems with IP. But I think when you work with companies and you're enthusiastic like I am and you just want to discover something, the, the last thing on your mind is IP about your discovery. Absolutely the last thing on your mind. If I'm told you're working with a company and I'm making really great advances, I don't think, stop, wait, don't tell them, I've got to, you know, I've got to protect my IP. I want to tell them, I want to tell the world, I want to publish straight away. And one of the things that I've learned through working with this company, um, Maestros Group, is actually they value that, they value my, my experience. I know that I'm not going to exploit anything, I'm not going to, if, if I put a patent on anything, 
Um, I'm not going to challenge that patent if, if, if Airbus come along and steal my ideas. I'm, I'm, you know, the university doesn't have the resources to sort of fight against Airbus in any challenge. So my attitude to IP is I'd rather give it freely on the understanding and trust with the team, build up the trust with you work, that you work, of the team that you work with in industry, is actually, the, you know, I will freely share my ideas with you, but you have to look after me and my research team. And we have to have a, a proper relationship where you will continuously fund me and I will continuously give you my ideas, but then you can go off and exploit, uh, exploit to your heart's content, as long as you carry on funding my research and my research students. And that's what we've done with these teams, you know, thankfully. And I do get problems with my commercial department who keep saying to me, you know, you should, you should put IP on on this and you know it, it's not the way I personally prefer to work um, so anyway so th for this it's, a, it's an extremely challenging environment these landing year I pointed out the landing year is my second favorite place on an aircraft um, this slides up and down within the tube and it's a hydraulic um, it's a hydraulic sort of um, action and that's what sort of absorbs the, the shock when you bounce down and you land and of course when they're testing these under certification tests they have to certify them the certification test lasts about five years um, and what happens is when they have a new aircraft design they have to go through about five to seven years through certification tests and if it fails at year five then they've wasted an awful lot of money testing they've probably wrecked the design and so on so they wanted us to monitor the um, landing gear during test and to be able to detect um, fatigue cracks now of course there's a problem here because aircraft landing gear aren't designed to crack so they aren't designed to fail at all and that must come as quite a relief for you all really um, so when we started working on this, we just couldn't get them to crack. So I was continually saying, they're fine, they're safe, I'm not picking up anything. But I couldn't actually prove to them that I would be able to pick up something should it have failed. So we had to go way beyond certification testing. And in the end, they're so, they're so really well designed, these things, we had to put false faults in. So I had to get there with my hacksaw and make a fault, make a, make a stress concentration, and then actually load it so that the load would apply through that stress concentration and we could get things to crack. And I, I do the acoustic emission monitoring, I do the interpretation of the signals. The signal analysis techniques are very much outside my area of, um, of expertise. And I came across Keith Worden and James Hensman was his student at the time. And Keith said, yeah, we can, we can interpret these signals for you. So uh, I won't try and explain the, to, in too much detail the source characterization that we did. But basically, it took us about three years to figure this out and looking at lots of signals. Really, it was almost like looking for a needle in a haystack, looking for where this fatigue crack starts. Um, but we, we together came up with two critical techniques. <coughs> One was called the lowest variance technique, which you can see on the left. And this looks at those clusters, those little earthquakes of activity, clustered in temporal space, that's the time they occur, and covered in, clustered in spatial um, space, so that's where they appear on the structure. And so that's why my location technique is very important. And if you think about it, a fatigue crack, a, a signal emanating from a fatigue crack, is going to be different from every other signal because it appears suddenly but it's going to be always appear in the same place because that crack isn't going to you know, widely go somewhere else. You're going to get a crack and that's going to grow. And so you're going to get very slight um, spatial movement. And then once the crack starts, that signal is going to be continuous amongst all the other noise. And this is what we, we developed. We developed two techniques. One was called the lowest variance technique, where the clusters were significant, meaning they were continuous and in the same place. And also a novelty detection technique when a different signal was different from the rest. And in this particular test, we've got lots of sensors monitoring from various points on the aircraft. And we, came, we had lots of sort of false hope through the test that a, a crack was occurring. We were monitoring the crack as well visually. But actually, when the crack did appear, which was here, um, we'd already had this precursor where all of these signals were, were showing us that the, the clusters were becoming more significant. And also here, where we were being shown that we were getting signals that were significantly difficult, different from the rest. And we were able to prove, um, with aircraft structures, because they've got such a low critical crack size, once they start cracking, you've got a very few thousand cycles. So this was actually 5,000 cycles between when we were picking that up and when the test finally, um, the, the whole structure finally broke through a massive catastrophic failure. But we were able to pick it up early. And this is, this is um, what the Messier Dieter and I called Saffron Group um, were looking for. We haven't commercialised this yet, we haven't put it into action yet, um, but we're hoping to in the near future. 
Okay, so um, on to, so that's, that's a flavour of the research that I do. And on to a little bit about my favourite thing, which is toys. Um, so one of the great things about being a scientist and engineer is you get to buy lots of toys, an experimentalist actually, you get to buy lots of toys and use them. So I thought I'd just give you an example of the toys that I'm using at the moment in my lab. Um, laser, laser vibrometry. Um, laser vibrometry for me has been an absolute godsend. Um, because if you remember I was talking to you about my signals that travel to the surface and I detect them with, with um, sensors. But it's very difficult then to um, interpret and prove um, you know, that the, the maths of your signals is, is, is being applied correctly and your models are applied correctly. And buying a laser um, vibrometry kit enabled me to monitor the surface vi uh, the vibrations and actually match the surface vibrations to what I was predicting in my mathematical models. And so I can scan full surface areas rather than just the area where my sensor is and I can actually see what's happening all over the surface and then make sure that's exactly what I'm believing I'm seeing on my sensor. So that's been really useful. And one of the things that I've used this for recently is in aerospace structures to determine where's the best place to put my position sensors to detect damage. So I need to maximise the signal travel to my sensors. I also need to minimise the number of sensors because sensors are expensive but also because sensors add weight to a structure. So if we're going to practically monitor a structure, we have to make sure we use as few sensors as possible. There's also issues about um, cables and so on. I won't go into those, that's a, that's a complication. And so vibrometry has enabled me to have a better understanding of the structure. Now if you look at this structure here, on, this is the back side of, of an aircraft um, structure, and you've got this, this plate here, but it's supported by stringers, and these stringers are attached to the, the structure. And they're actually my enemy, because what those, those stringers do is they suck the acoustic emission energy out of the structure. And they can stop me from seeing signals that I'm assuming that are traveling in a, in a plate. So if I assume that the plate be, behaves like a plate, then I'm wrong because these stringers stop it from behaving like a plate. So my laser vibrometry can help me. So this is a, this is a view from the laser vibrometry looking at that. You can see that the stringer is in there, and if I show you the sequence of photographs, so this is, I'm putting in a signal into the plate, this dotted line is the line of a stringer at the back, and if I just play this sequence through, that's the, think of dropping a pebble in a pond and watching the wave go out, so I'm putting a signal into the set of the material, the wave, the stress wave is travelling through the material, and look what I mean, this is the, this is the stringer, and look what happens as the wave progresses. The energy, so the colours of those are more, um, red means more energy and so on, but look at the energy that's sucked out. So if I was to put a sensor here, I would get great um, detection of the source because I'm very close to the source and it, the source is very strong there. The source gets weaker as you go out, but also it gets weaker because this stringer is sucking the energy away. So if, if I was assuming that sensors equal distance from that would see the same thing in my maths, I would be wrong because they're not. So the laser vibrometry helps me to interpret my signals much better. Okay, so another really fantastic toy that we've got at, at um, Cardiff is the Morgan Botty Lightning Laboratory. Uh, named after Rodri Morgan, the First Minister of Wales, who was um, very instrumental in getting the funding. We all rely on funding to fund our research. And also Jean Botti, who was the Chief Technical Officer of Airbus at the time. He's just moved to Philips Healthcare. Um, so this was established in Cardiff. And basically we make lightning. And it's so, it's so great to be able to make lightning in the lab. Um, it, it's, it's really, you know, the students love it, um, visitors love it. Joe Johnson came to visit us a few weeks ago and he, you know, we were showing him loads and loads of really fantastic science, but the one thing that was interesting is, can I press the button and make lightning? <laughs> we let him press the button, it was fine, we, we thought he might ask to do that. Um, but the reason we've got a lightning lab is that we are, people are very concerned with composite aircrafts about what the damage the lightning does. And so we are looking at um, uh, characterising the damage um, in composite plates. And um, so this is a big project in collaboration with Airbus. Uh, and a lightning strike damage is very rapid, happens very suddenly. It has a multi-physics effect on the, on the structure. It heats it, it gives you acoustic shock, it gives you a high current, it gives you a magnetic field. And it's really bad for composite structures. 
and um, this is a, a picture of a composite structure which has been struck by lightning and the lightning attached, so there was no way of the lightning being conducted away. And um, you can see significant damage um, occurred there. It's, there's a lot of delamination, there's a lot of burning, and there was, there was an actual hole through there. Now, hopefully, this will work on here. You have to watch this very carefully. I'm going to show you a lightning strike, but it happens very quickly. So you'll see nothing, then you'll see the lightning, and then you'll see the effects of it. Um, so it just takes a couple of seconds. Okay. I'll do that again because if you weren't looking, you probably missed it. So obviously it's dark in the chamber before we put the lightning in and then we press go, lightning happens and then you've got the uh, effects of lightning. It took quite a lot of filming to get that shot so I'm very proud of that shot. Uh, we've put all sorts of things in there and we, we've, struck, we've struck lots of things by lightning in there but mainly we use composite panels. Um, now another piece of equipment that I love is the digital image correlation equipment, this will just run and this is a, a, a sort of a, a, a 2D technique to look at the um, uh, full field strain in, a, in a, a panel and this is the results of this in a lightning strike and where the, strike, the lightning strikes you get attachment, this is the centre where the lightning strike, you get attachment but this is showing the displacement of the panel um, and the, you can see the, dis the panel displaces, it, it buckles out when the lightning strikes and it reflects back again and then buck and buckles back to normal. So we're characterising the damage that occurs in, in composite panels. Uh, right, quickly now in terms of research, everybody in the university knows all about impact. This was an impact case study in the REF. Um, it was the work that I did very early on when I came to Cardiff. Um, I looked at acoustic emission for monitoring um, bridge structures um, and the, the, the technique that we developed in conjunction with um, Maestras, who's the company I told you about, who I've got this um, you know, good relationship with where when they want research work done, they, they fund me and I tell them how their equipment should look to, to help us. Uh, we, we took extensive laboratory work um, from about 1993 to 2005. And this is a really good sort of um, story in terms of the impact case study rules. Um, I didn't even put this forward for an impact case study because I thought it wasn't enough impact and it wasn't until we were looking at those that God, this is really good. So it started off with a little bit of funding from EPSRC, which were then called SERC. I took it through to um, KTPs, which were called, um, what were they called? Large Transfer Partnership. They were called something else. Uh, teaching Company Scheme, TCS, yeah. So those are TCS, now they're KTPs, and they're br a brilliant vehicle for research with companies. And then we took them through various industrial contracts. Um, the, obviously, there are economic and societal benefits of stopping shutdown of, of major bridges. Um, the, the company's turnover increased from 300,000 in 2005, they were just a small company with a couple of people in them, 7.5 million in 2013, 5 million of that has been distributed directly to the research that Cardiff did for them, and they've worked on bridges such as the Seven Crossing, the Humber Bridge, Hammersmith Flyover as I mentioned and so on, and also applying this technique internationally. So that's research in the lab and then it's taken out all over the world, which I'm, I'm very proud of. Okay, so that was actually a, a, about normally a 50 minute talk. I've taken a few slides out and condensed it down for you into uh, about 20 minutes, 30 minutes I think. And now I've been asked to talk about you know, uh, my sort of journey, how I got here and uh, some thoughts on leadership. So um, I've just put these things out to remind me what I'm gonna say. So for me, the reason I'm an engineer and a scientist, I guess, is that I was always asking why. And I think there's a time and a place for these things. So when I was between the ages of five and 10, there were some great things that happened. Man landed on the moon. And people of my generation will always remember sitting down around the telly. It still makes me have shivers down my spine when I remember my family gathered around the telly watching those moon landings. It was just absolutely incredible. And so I was sat there asking, how did that rocket get there? Who makes those rockets? You know, wh how do they get that? So, you know, it was just very, very formative for me. Also, Concord, Concord's flight path, path was over my house. And so I used to go in the garden and hear the sonic boom. And I used to ask my, my mum and my dad, you know, my, they said it was a sonic boom. And I said, what's that? They we used to have a great big, you know, bookshelf of encyclopedias in my house. 
And my mum and dad always used to say, you must look it up in the encyclopedia because you must learn it for yourself. What I actually realised was they didn't know the answers to all my questions. <laughs> but in asking me to look it up myself, not fobbing it off, it actually sparked off that passion for finding things out for myself. So I've spent my lifetime looking things up. I still do. Every time I'm asked for anything, I look things up, I read, you know. And I've always been asking why, and I'm still asking why. And, and you know, that's, that's what, why I'm here. Um, in terms of career planning, I'm quite often asked to go and talk to young researchers on you know, their career plan, and they're being taught to you know, talk through their career plan and work out you know, where they want to be in five years' time. How often have you been asked in an in a interview, where do you want to be in five years' time, ten years' time? I have never, ever had a plan. So I would say some journeys are well planned, mine absolutely wasn't. Um, I, I never planned to go into academia. Um, I never even planned to do A-levels, so I had a motorbike at the age of 16, I'd done my GCSEs, I liked maths and physics, I desperately wanted to be an apprentice in engineering, I desperately wanted to go off and work in engineering. My dad was a mechanic and he had a garage which helped, so I was always tinkering with things. I, he had an apprenticeship going and he gave it to one of my best friends, who was a boy, because he thought girls shouldn't do engineering. Um, he changed his mind eventually, but he didn't think it was an environment for us, you know, delicate little girls, you know. And it's an interesting thing because I think that these journeys are funny because I'm one of four girls and my, my dad desperately wanted a boy and he gave up my little sister, but I was number three. And I think he'd begin, begin, begin to give up hope actually when I was born. And so, you know, he actually, I was allowed to be the boy in my family. So he needed somebody to help him in the garage. He needed somebody to go to rugby and football and boxing and all sorts of things like that with. So, yeah. so I was allowed to be the boy in my family. And, you know, um, we were talking earlier on the Grossman's talk about, you know, um, feeling different. And as a young female sort of scientist, and, you know, it's, it's sort of, um, it's, it's a hard thing to feel different. And I, I, you know, I agree with that. I can see my daughter struggling with, you know, those feelings of being, you know, highlighted as being different. But actually, I was always the different one in my family because I was allowed to be, and it was kind of celebrated. You know, so my, my three sisters kind of kept saying, oh yeah, Karen, she's the clever one. Oh yeah, she's the one who's good with, you know, good with motorbikes. She's the one who's good with engines. So that was kind of celebrated in my family to the point where I wanted it as a career, and then my dad went, whoa, you know, hang on, I don't want you to go into, um, you know, an apprenticeship and be, and actually at the time it probably wasn't, a, well, it definitely wasn't a good environment, very male environment, lots of swearing, lots of, you know, it was a pretty, pretty tough environment. He, t he wanted me, he believed in education, and I think that's a key thing, so he didn't want me to go to an apprenticeship then, because he wanted me to carry on and take advantage of the learning opportunity that A-levels would give me. So I agreed with him and I did the classic engineers, A-levels, uh, maths, chemistry, physics and further maths. Um, and I'm glad he, he encouraged me to do that. Those are the classic A-levels for engineering and I absolutely loved them because I loved the physics and maths, hated chemistry, I have to say, at that time. Now there's an interesting lesson which I share with people here. Uh, so you look at people who've got the name professor and pro-vice-chancellor and things like that and you think, gosh, that person, she's always been successful, you know. I failed two of my A-levels, so uh, I know exactly what happened, I got bored, I thought I could do it without working, and I discovered motorbikes again, and um, cars, and pubs, and boys, and all sorts of things that happen when you're 17, and at 17 I kind of switched off and I didn't do any work and I failed two of my A-levels. But my art teacher was um, really encouraging to me. She was the person who had encouraged me to um, look at it for a, an undergraduate apprenticeship. And I had this, I had everything, you know, in the palm of my hands. I had a place at Cardiff University to study mechanical engineering. I had this apprenticeship, you know, this, this sought after degree apprenticeship with Rolls Royce. And she said, right, let's, let's think about this. She said, why don't you ring up Rolls Royce and see whether they really care about your A levels, you know? So I rang them up and they said, it's fine, you know. As long as you've got the place at Cardiff University, we'll carry on supporting you with your undergraduate apprenticeship. So then she encouraged me to do this thing where I ran Cardiff University up and I said, I've still got a place at Rolls Royce if, you, if you'll take me. <laughs> <laughs> so they kind of, and they both said yes. And you know, it could have been so easily, I would have just not bothered to make those two phone calls and I would have just backed off and thought, I'm a failure. So, you know, perseverance is a really, you know, strong thing. But also, I think for me, I didn't realise how much she was mentoring me. 
And I think mentors are really important. Having those people around you who can encourage you, who can pick you up when you have fallen down, who can you know encourage you to think of outside the box perhaps and think a little bit more about you know just being being more resilient and asking those questions. So I didn't intend to do. Um, be an academic, so I, I did my degree, I went back to Rolls-Royce, uh, got a bit bored, met somebody who said there was a PhD going, you know, applied for that, got it, and then, and then I loved doing my PhD, I absolutely loved researching for three years, but I still didn't realise that research was in my heart. I still thought I was an industrial engineer, so I went into industry, I worked as a senior engineer for a few years, and just by chance that was the 80s, my company were making people redundant, I had been advising Cardiff University on the content of a new degree scheme, so I'd been in contact with them. There, there was one particular day in my life that turned me from an industrial engineer to, a, to an academic, which was a, a Friday. Um, my, it was in the 80s, um, in, industry is a very fickle place. The company had lost some money, they decided to make loads of people redundant. They gave me a list of the people that they wanted me to tell they were going to be made redundant. And I had this awful, and you know, sometimes people in, in um, universities don't believe me that this actually happened. I had this list of people who I had to say, you're going, and to clear the desk in 10 minutes, I had a list of people to say, you're staying, you know, carry on. And that's brutal. And that afternoon, that very afternoon, I was sat at my desk, I took a phone call from Cardiff University saying, oh, you know, you've been advising us on this new degree scheme. We might have a one-year contract. And we might, you know, be advertising it. Would you be interested? I absolutely jumped to the chance. So I left a well-paid job. I cut my salary by about 30%. I took a one-year contract. And so that's about being brave, isn't it? That was quite, I didn't realise it was brave at the time, but it was quite a brave move to go from this quite, you know, good job in industry, which I would have, I, I wasn't going to be one of the people who were made redundant. Um, but I just, you know, sometimes I think timing is right. So I took that opportunity. I, I went to Cardiff on a one-year contract and I realised I absolutely loved it and as soon as an academic job came up I, I took it and, and that's where I'm here. Now I know I am here, I know exactly what universities do, I think some people in the universities don't know what universities are here for. We're here, for, in my opinion, we're here to create knowledge and share knowledge and it's not just academic knowledge, we also create knowledge of how to run organisations so people in professional services help us to create that knowledge. But in terms of the academics, we create knowledge, we share it with our, ourselves, we share it with other academics across the world, we share it with our students. In fact, our students help us to create that knowledge, so they're part of this, this community which creates knowledge and shares knowledge. And we're here to inspire our students to go on and do better things than we've done, because they always do. Our students always exceed us. Um, PhD students, you know, they don't realise when they start that within about six months they'll know more than me on their subject because they're working very specialised you know, in that area. Um, and we also create knowledge which is useful to industry and society and I love doing that. So what I've done in my career is I've actually not planned to move up at any point. I've never said, you know, I'm an engineer, I want to be a senior engineer or I'm a lecturer, I want to be a senior, you know, I've never mapped that out. What I've always done is I've enjoyed what I'm doing at the time but I've always taken the opportunity to upskill and I don't think people value enough um, informal skills that you pick up. So you pick up informal skills all the time just by doing stuff. And it's not just in, in work. It's, you know, I, I coached a football team for a while because I'm passionate about sport as well. And um, local football team, local youth team needed a coach. But I picked up loads of leadership skills when I was coaching those boys. I picked up loads of organising, and they were all boys. Although in my last year of coaching, I did get a girl onto the team. And that's another story. And she was better than all of them. <laughs> and... Um, you know, organising them to be there on the right day, um, organising them to, to be organised on the pitch, um, but knowing actually that I didn't play the game for them, knowing that they were the play, play, people who played the game, but I was the person who enabled them to play the game. And I think that in my leadership role, I'm often thinking about that, is that I'm not playing the game for the people in my team, but I'm actually enabling them to play their games and to do what they do well. So, um, yeah, that's, that's picking up the skills around you. Um, yeah, finally, a couple of things, really. Um, I think that my, throughout my life, I've had people who I haven't realised have mentored me. So when I was at AB Electronics, I had a fantastic technical um, director who always supported me. I'm still in touch with him now. And um, I didn't realise that I was a mentor. I just thought it was somebody who was, you know, friendly, offering me, you know, little snippets of advice. But I've realised now, you know, he was a great mentor. 
Um, networks as well. Now, I always, people always say you've got to be good at networking. You know, you've got to do networking. And I always just say I'm rubbish at networking because I'm quite shy actually. And I, you wouldn't believe it because I can stand up in front of you, but I am quite quite shy. And I find it really difficult to open a door into a room full of people and to you know know what to do next and to know to go to talk to somebody. I usually go and get a drink um, because that sort of did, did, you know. Uh, delays the moment when you've got to go and say, hi, I'm Karen, what do you do? But I didn't realise that actually, you know, going out and meeting people is networking. So I love going to conferences, I love talking about my work, I love talking about my work afterwards, I love those sort of, you know, informal networking opportunities. So those are really important, meeting people. Working with people who you like, the Keith Worden that I spoke about has done some work with me. Um, one of the things that one of the reasons why we work so well together is that we met as a com at a conference. We realised we had similar ideas, but we also realised we were both very similar people. So we became friends before we became um, co colleagues and collaborators. And because of that, I trust him. So I always trust him that, that he would do the best for our research and that he trusts me in the same way. And working with people that you, you like and that you trust is far more enjoyable than forcing collaborations with people who you should be collaborating with but you don't really like. Um, finally, the thing about leadership skills, I'm often asked to comment on leadership skills and it's a really interesting thing because I think one of the reasons why um, we have such few leaders who are women in higher education is because the establishment has in the past valued a model of a leader which is, which is not the normal mode of operation of a woman. And so um, Emily Grossman earlier was talking about these job adverts where they say we're a dynamic team, we're, we're, we're um, competitive, we're beating the rest, you know, and those sort of, those words conjure up a very um, harsh, competitive, thrusting environment, which women just generally don't tend to, to be, that doesn't appeal to us, you know, generally, it, it sort of, it, it turns us off, and it turns us off subconsciously, and I didn't realise that until recently. <coughs> And there is a leadership style which has been favoured in a lot of organisations where you have to be strong, you have to not cry, you have to be brave, you have to be bold, you have to be winning, you have to be you know, aggressive, you have to, and this is sort of going off at the edges of it, you have to be thrusting, you have to be you know, um, forceful, you have to be you know, knowledgeable and all these things. And the, the, the model is normally that we conjure up of a leader is normally of a man. It's normally actually of, a, of, a, of an eld, older white man. And so that's the model of a leader. And people, you know, you have that model of a leader in your head and you can't, you know, sort of get away from that model. But leadership styles, it's so important to have diverse leadership styles in an organisation. Organisations value different leadership styles. They, they thrive when you've got different types of leaders. And actually the best leadership style is not trying to pretend to be what you're not. So if you are a, a, a white male, then be a white male. If you are a you know, blonde small woman, then be a blonde small woman. If your personality is one that you're nurturing and caring, then be that. But use those aspects of your personality to be your type of leader. I'm a very collaborative leader. I love working in teams. I love getting the best out of people. I love talking to people. And you know, I love sort of um, collegiality. So my leadership style has always been to bring lots of people together and, and try and use the best of their skills. I will never be the sort of leader who commands and controls. And I think the command and control model of leadership is really important because it used to be one that we thought was important. And now I think organisations are realising that the model of a king, you know, declaring what has to be done and not listening to others and the model of that, that command and control, actually it, it works in, in crises you know, you need to be strong in a crisis, but on day-to-day -day activity, it doesn't work so well and it, it turns people off and it, it actually petrifies people. If you've got a leader who, who works in that way, people are too scared to voice their opinion for fear of failure and fear of being wrong. So that leadership style genuinely doesn't bring out the best in people. So, you know, which, whatever stage you are of leadership, and I think we, I also like distributed leadership. So, you know, I think we've got leaders throughout the organisation. I think we've got some very, you know, we've got some students who are leaders, you know, that aren't my, I work with the Students' Union, and they show great leadership skills, and I'm valuing their leadership from, from their position. So valuing that distributed leadership, and if you're a student, working out that you are actually, you know, influential and you can um, influence up to, to influence the leadership of the whole organisation and, and that's really important. Right, okay, I can feel my voice um, going and my mouth drying so I think that's probably the end and I have got one more slide.
for the earlier part of the work, I'd like to thank all my collaborators, but particularly my students. This, this isn't all of them, but this is one occasion where most of them were in my lab. Um, and you know, the, the, and it is, there's a lot of males, because it is engineering, but there's a lot of women in there as well. I'm hoping there will be more women in the future. One of the things that, uh, interesting, um, Emily Grossman earlier said it's a really pity that only 20% of scientific professors are female. It's 4.5% in engineering, okay, so that's even lower. Um, so, but the pipeline is there, the talented women are there, and things, I'm very optimistic for the future because things are changing. So thank you all for listening. I love that question because you use the key word, influencer. And I think that, that, and I didn't mention that when I'm talking about the command and control, because some people think they have leadership through power and title and position, but actually the most effective leadership is through influence. And I think probably thinking back, I, I probably was quite influential in various roles through enthusiasm and, you know, so I've done lots of things like uh, you know, led a few political campaigns, you know, as a student been been somebody who, who led some, uh, it just seems, it just seems a hundred years ago now, but led protests about our grants being reduced, <laughs> in those heady days when we had grants to come to university. Um, so I think in, in thing, terms of, because I always ask the question why, because I want to find out why, I think that is in a sense a, a kind of an influencer because you, you talk to lots of people and you influence them finding out why and trying to make things better as well so yeah I think that I I probably without knowing it had some leadership skills which have developed and been honed over the years so yeah Yeah, okay, most universities do formalised mentoring um, and uh, in various different ways. So uh, many universities, when they have a new member of staff on probation, they will be assigned a probation mentor, mentor and um, then in certain research groups. So it depends you know, on your position in the organisation. I also think there's a, a real place for peer-to-peer -peer student mentoring. Um, so, you know, third-year students mentoring first-year students because life's difficult, isn't it? Stuff happens. Stuff happens and it helps to have somebody to um, talk to about and you know just bounce ideas off and I've quite often found in my conversations with people who are mentoring me or in people who I'm mentoring, the mentor doesn't have the answer but the mentor has the ability to listen and ask the right questions. The answer is it within you usually but the mentor kind of helps you to formulate that. Um, and also if a mentor is an older person who's been there before and has some life experiences they can be reassuring to say that you know to help you through difficult times to know that you're going to get come out of it and also to open doors for you. I think there's a there's also a, a sort of crossover between mentoring and being an advocate for somebody. So I quite often move you know if I'm mentoring somebody I quite often then move into the advocacy role where I'm putting them up for different places on committees and stuff like that. So I think that I don't think that anybody should have one mentor. I think you should have as many mentors as you can get and not actually label the mentor but just recognise what they're doing. So that's the bin form. But yes, coming back to, the, I think universities should acknowledge the importance of mentors and make sure that if people want a mentor, they have a, a wide range of people to suit, to choose from. Now the, uh, the first mentor that I was assigned in Cardiff University was, was a complete disaster. Um, there was no chemistry between us. I didn't feel able to, to share anything. The person didn't offer me any useful advice. So my first official mentor was a complete disaster. And I just, I voted with my feet. You know, the, 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 after the first meeting, or after the second meeting, um, you know, the comment was, well, you know, give me a call if you need me. I thought, I'm never going to call you. <laughs> so, but, you know, I, I, I had other people I could call. So I think that also making sure that people, if mentoring relationships aren't working, just switching them off and, you know, switching on another one because it's all about that relationship and the trust um, with the mentor. Yeah, they're riveted and glued. Yeah. Mm. So the glue gives a couplant, uh, and the what? Well, yeah, 
I could, oh, <laughs> I could go on for hours, but it's really complex. So the energy, it depends on which part the energy hits it. So yeah, it does transfer through the glue. It, it gets held up in the rivets, it goes into the rivets. There are also dissimilar materials, so it, it changes the wave velocity. So yeah, Absolutely. hugely complex with stringers. Are you a civil engineer? No. <laughs> that's what that's the well, civil engineering materials. I mean, the, the, the classic is, is concrete, mm. and I've been asked to do a lot of acoustic commission on concrete, and I hate it because it's full of cracks. So the the, the, the path for, uh, for the stress waves is difficult, but also there's cracks going on all over the place. Mm. Composite materials, yes, they're they're full of they're full of um, uh, what you can call faults which aren't cracks then you know, but the, the part of their design is the discontinuity so you've got the you know you've got the um well by by dint of its name it's a composite so you've got dissimilar materials um, you've got the fiber and you've got the matrix and and you know the the, the space between those is a cracking effect so yeah and, and tiny tiny critical crack size uh steels are are, are, are high strength steels don't have cracks in until they get a tiny, tiny crack. Um, at, the, at the minor molecular level, they probably are full of cracks, but yeah, the cracks that are gonna form fatigue cracks and then grow. So, so they are full of cracks that don't grow, but then once something initiates into a crack, that is, the initiation stage is the most important, and then that turns into what we define as a growing crack. So it's probably, it's probably better to say a growing crack. Mm. Yeah, and difficult to define because they're so small. Yeah, yeah, and the interesting thing was with the work we did with Doughty, um, I've been I've been used to working in um, my, my my research had been applied to bridges, to steel box girders, in fact, where the crack was starting behind a weld, <coughs> going through the weld and, and immersing. So they were quite big cracks. You know, I'm I'm showing you that size. These are quite big. Those are big cracks in a bridge. And um, the civil engineering structures are always quite done, so they would go to cracks that big before you start worrying. <laughs> so they, <laughs> but the bridge is, you know, think of the Severn Bridge, you know. So anyway, so um, and when I started working with um, Doughty, and they were talk, they were talking about finding cracks pre-initiation, and I said, yeah, I think we can do that. And they, they actually meant sort of pre, really, really pre-initiation, you know, and, and it wasn't and even, you know, before you don't ever get any visible sign of them. So they never break the surface, these cracks that they're trying to find. And we did, you know, uh, but the difficulty is then proving you found them because there's no other method that can find them. But actually acoustic emission finds them before any other method. And then you have to grow them and monitor them and then when you get the crack break in the surface you can go back and say, see, I told you so. <laughs> If I knew that, <laughs> I'd probably be far more successful. Um, it, fun, getting funding for research is really difficult, and um, you know, it's it's a case of being persistent. Um, because the the fact of the matter is that you know, so for instance, we were looking at European grant applications recently, with a success rate of ten percent. And what that means to a researcher is that for every ten grant applications you slave over, you you know, you, you sweat, you blood, sweat and tears into a, a grant application for probably three months, four months, five months, six months, a year. Um, for every ten of those you only get one funded by the law of averages, so definitely resilience. But also it depends on what type of funding you're looking at. So for me, um, I haven't had a huge, I don't have a huge EPSRC grant portfolio, even though I work in, in two um, advisory bodies on EPSRC now. They, they want me to be an advisor because I've actually had a lot of success in getting industrial funding. And I think one of my reasons for success in industrial funding is that I always, I love doing research which is applicable to industry. I love the why, the how, you know, so on. And so whenever I've worked with industry, I've always asked them, what problem do you want me to solve? And then thought about how I can solve it and then gone to them with a proposal. So a lot of my funding has started off with industry funding to investigate something, and then it's maybe moved into EPSRC funding to because there's something, there's some fundamental bit of research that's missing. So then you 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 write a case to justify the scientific research. And I think that you know the EPSRC funding is probably the most important one for a young researcher to, to go for, or research council funding. Um, it's very competitive, but you have to have a good idea and your proposal has to be excellent. 
Um, and you know, if people can see that you've thought through the idea, that you've thought through how you're going to do your proof, you've thought through your experimental program, and that you have an idea that can really make a difference, then those are the, those are the ones that get funded. Um, and then European research grants, well, who knows? I mean, they're a mystery and they're very fickle. Um, fellowships, I think, is a really good um, thing to encourage young researchers to do because that gives your work some independence. Um, but again, you have to have a, a new idea for that. Um, but, you know, work harder. I mean, it sounds silly to say work harder, but I know so many people who get, you know, to 95% of submitting a grant and then give up at the last bit because they're, you know, they've got too much teaching or too much this. It's just that resilience to actually just um, keep keep going. And I also think that we all work to time scales. And one of the difficulties with, say, EPSLC responsive mode funding is there's no cutoff. So, you know, most engineers and scientists are perfectionists. Most people will work for years and years on an idea and never think it's good enough. So just know when it's good enough and, and you know, set yourself a, t a time limit. So actually set yourself deliberately, say, I will put in a grant proposal in. You know, if you're thinking of it now, we'll put in a grant proposal in, in September 2016 and actually, you know, do a Gantt chart like you would tell your students, but do a Gantt chart to work towards that and make sure you, you lock out areas of time to work on it. Because if you don't block out areas of time, actually the undergraduate students usually take priority because they're more pressing and they're more, you know, they're, 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 they need you. So you will always, um, you know, forsake your own research for dealing with people who need you. So you have to be sort of, I, I wouldn't describe it as being selfish because I think it's good for you and good for the university and good for students eventually, but I think you have to be quite deliberate in, in carving out areas of time where you will work. And that's what you'd do if you were in industry, you'd actually be charging areas of time. So you'd actually be, you know, officially working on something at a, you know, and if we can all think of, uh, of our time in that way, we can be more effective in, in getting those things finished. Well, yes, I, I do believe there is. I mean, I've always been a member. I, I joined as, uh, it, was my, it was my goal in life to be a chartered engineer because the chartered status gives you some sort of validation in your career. But also the, the learning opportunity it gives you to meet with people. So the events that the, the institutions put on, um, you know, are always very interesting. And also, you know, being part of that community, which actually, um, you know, furthers the state of, of the, you know, so the Institute of Physics or the Institute of Mechanical Engineers. The, 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 the aim is that, you know, that knowledge that we're creating as scientists and engineers is actually fed into that and disseminated. And, and as groups of people, we, we take on, um, you know, a, a, the sort of um, uh, looking after the profession. So you're looking, by becoming a member, you're looking after your profession for the future. You're, you're nurturing it for the future. So yeah, des I, I would, you know, encourage you. I don't know what bureaucracy you've come across. You know, I think bureaucracy is caused by people and maybe yeah, you've had an unlucky, you know, situation. But in my experience, the membership of these things isn't, isn't bureaucracy. It's more, um, you know, being, being a, a member, of, you know, a part of the community. It's a combination of things. Um, the senior leadership team in Cardiff is, is more than 50% women. Um, that's not been through any quotas or anything, that's just been by, by encouraging women to apply. Uh, we've got a, an organisation in, in Wales called Quarateg, which is Welsh for Fair Play, um, and they help us to look at our adverts to make sure that they're not um, attracting, you know, they're not written in terms that, that only attracts men. Um, we actively, I mean, I personally, if I'm headhunting for using a, a search company for a role, I will send back a list that only has men on it because there are great women out there. Um, we were talking earlier about, um, you know, things like this, things like inviting women to speak. Um, if you're given a list of, you know, these are all the speakers over the year in science and they're all men, challenge it. You know, because it's only by making uh, women, giving women the, the, the floor and the limelight and, you know, that they will be noticed. Um, in, in, I think in all universities we're, we're very conscious of the Athena Swan um, charter now. And when we first, um, and I'll show you a story, I, I was head of school of engineering when we decided to go for Athena Swan and I said, oh, we can do that easily, it's a great place to work for women. You know, look at me, I'm head of the school, it must be great. So we went straight in and applied for Athena Swan Silver. Didn't even get bronze. It was awful. And actually, when I looked at it, it was so obvious I should have read the rules. Because, <laughs> because what they're looking for 
for is evidence that you've been proactive in enabling women to succeed, enabling, you know, encouraging women to apply and so on. And, and it, certainly just having a woman as head of school doesn't do that. Um, you know, it showed that I, I managed to get there, but it doesn't show that anybody else can manage to get there. And so, you know, it was a heartbreaking moment for me, actually, and a very humbling moment. But then when I reformed and looked at it, you know, and I actually saw then the value of Athena Swan is not the badge of honour, actually, you know, so it's not about getting the, the bronze or the silver or the gold, it's actually about the journey that you've gone to get there. So you look at your figures, you work out whether there's any way you're, you're discriminating. Um, you work out, you know, you just, you, you just do an action plan and everything you, you do deliberately with an action plan will reap benefits. So it's being deliberate about what things you can do in order to enable things to happen. One of the things that, that I did um, in terms of when I became head of the School of Engineering, I looked at everybody's CVs. There were quite a few um, that were people who were lecturers who I looked at the CV and I thought that looks like the CV of a reader actually or people who were senior lecturers I thought that looks like the CV of a professor so all of those ones who, who appeared to be you know um, not in the right role I, I got them in and asked them to apply for promotion many of them said oh, I'm so glad you you asked me I never thought anybody was going to ask me and I said well, didn't you realize that you didn't have to be asked and that's such a simple thing, but I think often it's the women and certain types of men who wait to be asked. So they wait for their boss to encourage them to go for promotion rather than proactively. So, you know, as leaders, encouraging people to go for promotion. And that first year, there were loads and loads of women promoted in my school. And um, one of the kickbacks to that was I overheard a coffee room conversation where somebody said, um, isn't it strange how all those women have been promoted as soon as Karen became head of school? <laughs> And I said, yes, and isn't it strange how all those men were promoted when we had men heads of school? <laughs> so, you know, so, so, yeah, you know, they're, 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 you know they're, there's just things you can do to encourage people who are good enough. And that's the thing. It's not about male or female. It's about looking at people. If they're good enough, then encourage them to, to, to be promoted. I'd like to thank you once more for the excellent talk. And uh, I'd like to everybody join me to thank you for being here.